Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today for Wild Tomorrow Fund's live stream discussion for World Pangolin Day. My name is Wendy Hapgood, and I'm one of the co-founders of Wild Tomorrow Fund. We're a wildlife conservation charity focused both in New York and on the ground in Zululand, South Africa. Um, as you saw from that introductory video, our mission is saving wildlife and wild places. And at our Ukawela Reserve, a wildlife reserve in South Africa, we are actively saving, reconnecting and restoring habitat to fight back against the extinction of wildlife. Now, our reserve is not yet home to pangolins, but they've been reintroduced just next door at and beyond's Pinda Private Game Reserve. So we're really excited to tell you more about pangolins today, including those lucky pangolins. So for today's special World Pangolin Day event, I'm super excited to introduce you to two amazing conservationists who are both protectors of pangolins. And they're each involved in pangolin conservation in really in very different ends of the illegal wildlife trade in Africa. So today we'll go on a journey with them, with Leno and Adams from darkness to hope. We're going to go from the intensifying of poaching for Af of African pangolins in Central Africa to the hopeful story of their rehabilitation uh, from the illegal wildlife trade back into the wild in, Zoo in South Africa. Uh, and for those of you watching with kids today, don't worry, we're not going to show any gruesome poaching photos, so <laughs> it's safe for the kids. Um, now, before I bring in our amazing pangolin protectors, I want to just make a quick note that today is going to be really interactive and we want to hear from you out there in the audience live. So if you're on Facebook or on YouTube, you can use the comments to send us your questions for Leno and Adams um, and we can share them on screen and um, have them talk to you about it. Um, and really important, it is World Pangolin Day. So if you are moved by what you're seeing and you want to help to be a pangolin protector too, you can go online to wildtomorrowfund.org slash pangolin and donate. And we'll make sure that 100% of your donations go to protecting pangolins in the field. So um, let's bring, I'm really excited to bring in our first guest into the studio. Um, let's bring in, this is Adams Kasinga, welcome. Thank you. Hi, Wendy. Hi, everybody. Um, Adams is such a brave man, and he is the founder and CEO of Conserve Congo, um, an NGO in the, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. He's also an honorary ranger, a Nat Geo emerging explorer, and he's truly fighting for Congo's biodiversity um, and, and such a brave fighter for pangolins, too. So, Adams, can you tell us about your organization and the work that you're doing? <laughs> Thank you very much, Wendy. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh, happy uh, World Pangolins Day to everyone. And uh, my name is Adams, just like uh, Wendy just mentioned. I represent a local nonprofit called Conserve Congo. In fact, Conserve Congo has been in existence since 2013. Uh, and we are based in Kinshasa on the west of uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And you may wonder why uh, conserve Congo. And that's because we are born out of necessity. And necessity was of uh, preserving the biodiversity of the Congo Basin. We do that through five, uh, three uh, distinct objectives. One of them being uh, the fight against the scourge of wildlife trafficking, as well as poaching. Two is education of uh, masses, including youth. And three, using agriculture as an option to poaching, but also to ensure food security. Uh, in our eight years of existence, we have investigated over a thousand cases involving wildlife trafficking, not only within our borders, but even outside our borders. Uh, of those thousands, we have brought over 500 to court level, but due to technicalities at this moment, we only have about 20 to 25 prosecutions. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, this year, and I th last year, um, December, we made a bust of about half a ton of pangolin scares right here in Kinshasa. Mm -hmm. And as we speak, we're still on the tracks of other poachers who are detaining about three and a half tons of pangolin scales. 
now you can imagine how many animals have been murdered for for them to be able to to amass such an amount of uh, scales. We are really glad that uh, here in the DRC, we have about four of the eight subspecies of the pangolin. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, unfortunately here in the DRC, only the giant pangolin is protected nationally. And that is despite the fact that we are also signatory of the CITES, which is a convention which regulates the trade of uh, endangered wildlife. Yes. So in a nutshell, that's who we are. <laughs> and uh, we work with uh, other sister organizations across our nine borders. And we're so excited, Adams, to have you here today and talk about your work, truly you and your team on the front lines, defending pangolins from poachers, but also a lot of other species that you work with. I have a picture of um, that you sent me of not just a pangolin, but, but where is it? I'm just looking for this. This is another species that you work with a lot, um, sadly, right, in the Congo. <laughs> it's cute. Yes. That is a bonobo. Uh, mm. That is a bonobo which we saved a while ago. And surprisingly, that was one of the earliest cases which got prosecuted here in the DRC. So before Conserve Congo, no, uh, no wildlife trafficker had ever been uh, have, has had ever spent time in jail here in the DRC. And today we are sitting at about 25 prosecutions. So we are really proud. And that is despite the fact that we face many challenges, including funding and uh, other challenges, such as corruption and so on and so forth. Yes. Um, and is it, so for people that haven't, um, learned yet a lot about the pangolin you know it is sadly the most trafficked animal in the world um and you know that there are more pangolins being killed every day than elephants and rhinos combined so they don't get quite the attention necessarily that uh, some of the bigger species get and um there was this statistic that in the 10 years between 2004 and 2014 just those 10 years more than 1 million pangolins were killed and th and that's like 300 every day and that continues and um what i read is that you know well the eight species of pangolin four in asia and the other four in africa um once the the species had declined in in asia then more of the attention has been on poaching of the African pangolins. Did you see that, Adams, that there was this escalation locally in um, demand for pangolins? Are you seeing more and more of them at the wildlife markets? Yes, definitely. Um, uh, the pangolin is, uh, uh, is the in thing right now in the wildlife uh, trafficking sphere. As a matter of fact, I believe uh, the DRC and Nigeria are leading at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, in, the last, in the last three years, I think 80% of all seizures made across the world, they emanated from the DRC and Nigeria. And that is another reason why we should put a lot of efforts here in Central and West Africa in order to fight uh, the schedule of wildlife trafficking, mainly that of pangolins. So yes, we are leading uh, DRC and Nigeria. And even in the local markets, in the local... <laughs> Uh, wildlife trafficking circles, we are coming across a lot of them. Sometimes we even come across uh, live ones. Mm. And actually, Adams, we have some video footage from that you kindly shared with us. Um, and I can put it on the screen and maybe you can explain what's happening because you have a team of of brave <laughs> agents, I don't know what you call them, uh, undercover rangers that um, go out and actually um, bust the the poachers can you tell us like what is that process you have to collect the intelligence and then you have to video like how do you go about busting a pangolin or a wildlife trafficker so we came up with this uh, specific mode of operation and which i believe we are currently the only organization in central africa which does it and uh, we have got about 60 volunteers. All of us are young yeah. people below ages of 40. And we are all Congolese citizens who are very much preoccupied by the uh, safety of our natural heritage. And uh, 
we are split into four different departments. The first department is the investigations department. This is where we deploy uh, investigators on the ground and they snoop around looking for potential uh, traffickers, both those who buy and those who sell. And mm -hmm. after investigating a, a, a number of times and uh, accumulating enough evidence, they now bring back the intelligence to the office. And together we sit down and try to analyze the information. And once we can have something which can really make us believe that the person may be a trafficker, then now we put the person on surveillance. Once we put a person on surveillance, we organize what we call an operation of arrest. And now this department of operations specifically works together with the authorities. And when I mean the authorities, I mean the police, I mean the uh, justice system, I mean uh, uh, the, uh, the customs office, and together we organize a bust. And because a wildlife crime is very difficult to prove in our courts of law, so we are very, very particular about catching the person the hand in the sack. So sometimes mm -hmm. we can pass ourselves being buyers, sometimes we can pass ourselves as sellers, sometimes we can pass ourselves as, as uh, fellow traffickers. And this way the suspect is arrested. Once the person is arrested, we now pass the, the docket so our legal department is the one that works now with, together with the judiciary. So they not only monitor the way the magistrate and the prosecutor is doing uh, follow up on the case, but they also monitor our lawyers because we cannot mm. represent ourselves in a court of law. And yeah. surprisingly, when we go to court, we represent the state. So we launch the case on behalf of the state because we have noticed that our state is not interested. They do not think that wildlife crimes are very serious crimes enough. And we mm. as citizens of this country have decided to take the matters into our own hands and we represent the, the, the state. Fortunately enough, the authorities have accepted and have given us that uh, go ahead. And we Wonderful. usually do that. We are only one of the two countries, as in Uganda, where a local NGO can do that. And wow, we are really proud of our work. And because of this system, we have uh, come up with a database. We have a full database, which we share with uh, not only our government and authorities, but even international organizations and agencies have started to, to get interest in our work. Even the Interpol sometimes requires wow. our assistance in terms of information. As a matter of fact, yeah, before yesterday, there was uh, a seizure in Singapore because of the information which we gave and it was Rhino Horn coming from the DRC which was arrested in Singapore and that wow. is uh, information that we gave. That's uh, excellent. I think six months ago, there was a bus in Zimbabwe also of about 32 monkeys which were mm -hmm. arrested because of a tip off which came from us. So that's how we have uh, managed to expand our scope of work by mm -hmm. networking with organizations and as well as other security agencies, because wildlife trafficking is the fourth most lucrative crime in the world. Yes. So it affects other spheres of our life because money emanating from there sponsors other crimes such as, uh, as um, insecurities and wars on the continent, coup d'etats and, and stuff like that. So we have to join our hands in order to fight this courage. Right, and it is truly international crime. This is high-level syndicated crime, and their network is all around the world. I know there's an incredible amount of pangolin scales, ivory being shipped out from Congo through Nigeria and out to Asian markets. Um, but Adams, I want to show some of this video because I think for us it's truly fascinating to think about the work that you're, you do and um, to sort of see it through... I guess, I don't know if this was undercover or just filming after the, after the bus itself, but let me just put this on screen and maybe you can talk us through what's happened. Adams, what's happening here? This is big scales, bags of pangolin scales. Oh, hang on. Oh. Adams, you have to unmute your microphone, sorry. 
There we go. I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, that's all right. Yes, it uh, so that was last year, and as you can see, those bags, those bags are full of pangolin scales, and in total, it was about 600 kilograms of pangolin scales. We arrested about seven suspects. Coming um, from the northern part of the country, and that's you and, there. And uh, you can see they were working with the cover police. You don't know who's who, but uh, I am busy commanding the operation, and uh, we are getting the suspects to to court. Wow, there were seven in total. Uh, that uh, 600 kilos is uh, it's almost a million dollars. That's the strict value. So it is a lot of money. And in this game of wildlife trafficking, what is very important. At this stage, I think pangolin scales rank number three on the list uh, of uh, wildlife products, and that is after mm -hmm. the rhino horn and the ivory. Wow. Yeah, and it's something that's become more popular, so to speak, with wildlife. That's Can you unmute again? Sorry. <laughs> Out of the trade. Uh, this one, this video here, it might mute you when I play it. I think you can, if you look closely, you can see the pangolin, I think, uh, or scales. Is that, he's sitting on a pangolin there? No, when they put the bag, the, pr the bag probably tore and they, they uh, spill out. Yes. Okay. Let me just play that again so people... Mm -hmm. So uh, we saw the handcuffs there. That was where they had been arrested? They were being arrested. There were seven suspects in total. Uh, um... Three were did go scot free, but four are still serving their sentence to date. We are very proud okay. that at least prosecution took place. Yeah, is it hard to get the judges to um, take wildlife crime seriously, or are they starting to to pay more attention now? Today, with uh, with a kind of uh, so our, our education is not only for the youngsters. So we target the youth, but we also target the authority. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we Adam's, call it call we have a bit of a lag because he's joining us because all the way we from. Put them in a, yeah, so we, we put them in a position whereby we show them uh, what, what is the reason why we need to protect these animals and mm -hmm. uh, what they should gain. And that they shouldn't, they shouldn't underestimate this. This is the fourth most look crime. So if yeah. you if you prosecute a wildlife crime, it's almost as prosecuting a drug dealer. So it's the same impact. And once they understand that, for instance, on the western part of the country, it's already a, a conquered place. And this year, since late last in part, with the focus on Virunga, Virunga is another mm. hotspot for poaching. And we have opened another office in Goma, and with the kind of uh, interest now coming in from left, right, and center, we are now able to open up a new office. So we are gaining a lot of trust of uh, donors and funders, as well as other institutions and organizations which work for the welfare of uh, wildlife. I'm putting uh, your URL up there um, so everyone can check it out and see all the work that you're doing. Um, let me show, yes. there's this, Recent, so last time we spoke to Adams, <laughs> it was for World Ranger Day, and he was very, um, it was very exciting because Adams was in the car and he was joining us, uh, but in the middle of a bus. So he was sort of backup eyes on his guys who were in the middle of an investigation. Um, and Adams, you had some, that was the bus that was successful just recently, right? Yes, that's it. And I have a That's video right. that you sent me about that. Let me um, see if this will. Okay.
en fait des problèmes. Le problème, on entend parler dans les milieux je crois. On est dans ces milieux ruraux comme ça, parce que c'est ici où le chien commence. Bonsoir, bonsoir, bonsoir. Ce sont les chasseurs. Alors ça, ce sont des chasseurs ouais, ouais. de village. C'est un peu des Ce sont eux qui ont interpellé. C'est pas paradoxal que vous saluez les, bra les braconniers, vous qui défendez le... Non, pas vraiment. Tous chasseurs, la chasse fait partie de l'autre. Chasser pour faire rien. C'est ça le braconnage. Et pour le simple fait qu'ils ont, ils ont interpellé, ça montre leur bonne foi de vouloir... What do you say? Is that that was actually where the bust happened, Adams? Right. So those uh, those are the informants who mm -hmm. inform us on uh, where the traffickers had passed, and they were there to show us. We you can see we had a camera with us, and I'm busy showing them the tracks, which route they take. And with us, if you watch the remainder of the video, you're going to see that they had dropped a pangolin, a pangolin along the way. And unfortunately, that pangolin was even pregnant. Oh. Uh, it's such, yes, it's such a, a pity. And uh, this is how we work with the community and the community uh, have gained trust in us so much that if they see something which is not right, they immediately inform us. And in that bust, we got about 15 pangolins in total. Unfortunately, oh, wow. they were all dead already. And usually they supply to Chinese restaurants. And um, also, you understand that in rural areas in our country, that is where eating uh, bushmeat is out of mm -hmm. survival. But in, in, uh, in urban areas, it is a delicacy. And it's not just for everyone. Like a lower class person would not get access to bonobo meat or pangolin meat. That is for the upper class or maybe upper middle class. Mm -hmm. And uh, we try by all means to sensitize everybody so that they can be aware that you can either eat that delicacy today and your children will spend huge amounts of money tomorrow to go to China and see them in cages, mm -hmm. or you just eat ordinary food so that our children and grandchildren can see and enjoy this beautiful gift given to, to us by God. Mm. And yes, I understand it is work in progress, but we are doing our part. And I wish that we could get like a hundred organizations like ourselves doing this because our country is so huge. Our country is almost twice the size of South Africa. Mm. You know, uh, Belgium, Belgium gets into our country 80 times, the size of the entire Eastern Europe. That's another challenge. So we need a hundred atoms. <laughs> Exactly, at least. <laughs> at at least. least a thousand. Um, well, thank you, Adam, so much for the work where you do. And, and as people can hear, it's, a, it's really a fight uh, on such a big scale. And if you want to help Adam's, his team um, for pangolin anti-wildlife trafficking in particular need smartphones and undercover cameras and GPS devices. So if you donate, we'll make sure that... Um, Adams can uh, buy more of that equipment, which he needs to be able to do his investigations. So, I mean, I think Adams is really on the front line of, of a story that's kind of echoes around parts of Africa, which is wildlife trafficking. And um, this, this poaching is really pushing the pang African pangolins towards extinction. And um, so we really need to act now. And I'm glad that World Pangolin Day is a day to raise awareness about it. Um, so that's the dark side of the pangolin story, but we also have a brighter side with Leno. So let me, we're gonna bring you back in towards the end, Adams, but I'm gonna introduce everyone for now. So we'll see you soon. <laughs> um, no let's bring in Leno. This is Leno Hola. Sierra. Hola. <laughs> um, she's actually Mexican, but is works for the African Pangolin Working Group in uh, KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa as the field manager managing this reintroduction of rescued, rehabilitated pangolins back to the wild. Can you tell us about your amazing job, Leno? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Wendy. Hi, and hi, everyone who is joining us. Thank you for joining us in this World Pangolin Day. Um, well, the, the program that I work with is run by the African Pangolin Working Group uh, and also in conjunction with the Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital. Um, 
with two, mainly two game reserves now in KwaZulu Natal, in the province of KwaZulu Natal. Hopefully, soon there's going to be more reserves joining this program. And we are reintroducing the Temmings ground pangolin, which is uh, the particular species that occurs in that part of Africa, in the southern Africa. Uh, reintroducing it into an area that were locally extinct for, it seems to be known, at least three decades. So all the animals that we are reintroducing in that area have been poached, have been rescued in sting operations in a work similar to what Adams do at uh, DRC, um, run by the African Pangolin Working Group with the South African police and other organizations. Those animals are rescued and then they're brought to a recovery process in the Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital where Dr. Karim Lawrence and all her amazing team um, treat these animals to, to bring them to proper conditions to then be, then be relocated and reintroduced back into the wild. It's a long process and sometimes when, when even to me, when I wasn't involved in this, it sounds like, okay, they're rescued, they're cured, and then they're released. And, and wow, beautiful, the animals back into the wild. But the amount of resources and work that it requires that an animal is back in the wild, believe me, it's much more than you expect. The process of soft release that we need to do in order to these animals to adapt to their new environment, it's hard work. Trust me, it's much more than any of us, even any of us expected. I have this really beautiful photo that you sent me. Hang on, oops, um, let me, oh, there we go. <laughs> Put this up. Here's Leno as pangolin mom. Like this is part of that process, right? When is it, can you tell us, is the pangolin too young to fend for itself here and you have to, to help it grow before it can be released? Yeah, in this particular case, that pangolin is called Ramfi. He lives mm -hmm. currently uh, in Pinda Game Reserve in Kwasulu Natal. It was the, the first young pangolin that was hand raised and then released back into the wild. I was lucky enough to be involved in the last part of his uh, rehabilitation, his, the soft release process. I always like to point out whenever people see uh, humans in interacting with pangolins, that is, is not what it looks like. A lot of people would say, oh, that's so cute. I would love to give the bottle to a baby pangolin. Uh, pangolins are not very easily to interact with humans. Their natural uh, reaction will be to be scared and shy and afraid and stressed and many other things. This particular animal, as I'm saying, he was rescued when he was very young. He was used to interaction and mainly to their carers. In that case, it was me in the last months of his soft release process. He was very young. Uh, uh, in that part of the process, we were winning him from milk and I, I was giving him water instead because of course he was waiting for his bottle he was used to the bottle still uh, that animal we were waiting for him to to be six kilos and a half to be a safe weight and condition to be released and to be out on his own of course we see, we use tracking devices and we keep a very very close monitoring of them uh, when they are released but but he was very close to his release process today Rampy is a healthy big male well big not super big <laughs> but he's still growing um, he's is, around. Is that, is that that's him? him? That's him again. He's eating at their actually cocktail ants, one of their favorites, or particularly his favorites. Uh, you can see his belly full of ants that are biting him, but they are too good, too good to stop. Sometimes you even see them like, uh, like doing this because some ants are defending themselves, of course, and defending the nest, but mm -hmm. they still uh, eating on them, feeding on them, and it's amazing. Wow, and I've got this other picture here. Um, it looks like it's its tail is hugging you. Like, is that how it holds on to you when you're when you're carrying them in the field? Yeah. Well, uh, of course, with grown-up pangolins, the interaction is very different. Uh, this particular photo is also from a young pangolin. That's Corey. Corey is now released in Magnoni Game Reserve, also in the province of KwaZulu Natal. Um, and yeah, their tails are prehensile and very, very strong. These animals are very strong. And of course the tail, it's used when they wrap themselves to protect, the tail will close on the top of the head very tight. So those mm -hmm. tails are incredibly strong. Um, and as I'm saying again, this is a young pangolin that was very used to me because I was four months every single day in her soft release process. So he mm -hmm. will move around me quite comfortably as you can see in this photo, but yeah, they will grab with their tails naturally because that's how they hold sometimes with, from logs or rocks when they're going up or down. They use a lot the tail to help themselves move around. So sometimes, yeah, they grab you quite, quite <laughs> tight. 
What I think is amazing about Leno is she's someone who's spent more time with a pangolin than most people on our planet, which is such an amazing, uh, I'm sure, experience. Do you, how many pangolins have you personally helped, well, have been released, do you know, to the wild in, in KwaZulu-Natal? I don't have the exact numbers, but but we will be close to 20 maybe in total. Of course, mm -hmm. uh, most of them uh, with successful uh, stories even to the date some of them unfortunately not because remember all these pangolins have been rescued from the trade and some of them their their condition their health condition never pick up enough uh, mm -hmm. or sometimes natural situations as well um, but uh, yes I've been privileged enough not only to spend a lot of time in the field monitoring pangolins that have been released or the soft release process from some pangolins but to be involved in the particular two cases of the young pangolins that we keep for longer periods mm -hmm. so that gave me an opportunity to observe a pangolin for at least three hours every day and and believe me I still amaze every day I'm in the field out there I'm currently in Mexico visiting my family because <laughs> I got stuck for reasons that we all know, <laughs> I got stuck there. So I, I've been able to observe them for so long periods, every single day, the same animal in the same area feeding. So I've been able to interpret maybe or read somehow their particular behavior on, on each individual. That's Cori as well. That's a soft mm -hmm. process of, of Cori that was actually during the first part of the pandemic. Um, so even the reserve was incredibly quiet and, and I had the privilege with FP and other members of the Manioni team that, that every need, everyone needs to get involved. As Adam mentioned, uh, it's, it's never enough people, it's never enough resources, it's never mm -hmm. enough money to, to do what we have to do. Uh, the crisis with pangolins is it's an emergency. And, yes. and when people says, how can we help? Anyhow, believe me, <laughs> anyhow, we need help in any way you can imagine. Yes. Talk about them, share a post, make them popular, learn, read, donate money if you're in the possibility support organizations and yeah so that's also while well, we spend so long times there waiting for them to feed when they're in the soft release process uh, we take them out so they feed themselves so we of course we say we're going to walk a pangolin and some people imagine <laughs> us with a leash walking a pangolin and and in, the truth is that it, it is pretty much the other way around the pangolin walk <laughs> us you put the pangolin in the ground he's gonna be led by his his smell that is their stronger uh, sense. And he's gonna find his own ants and termites. That's Ramfi in Pinda Game Reserve last uh, last year, uh, feeding on a snouted harvested termite mound, which he mm -hmm. loves as well. And sometimes he can spend two minutes or sometimes he will spend 40 minutes in a spot. Sometimes he will take you to walk everywhere. And of course, remember, we're working in big five game reserves. So you're, you're walking in the bush with <laughs> all sort of kind of predators. This is the APU team from Manioni Game Reserve following me that, that day um, to walk Cory. I was going to put it in the ground and then follow her for two to three hours until she wow. feeds enough. Mm -hmm. So, so Lena, you li literally, ha if you have a pangolin in the soft release uh, stage, how many hours of a day do you follow them or monitor them? Well, if, if it's in the soft release process, the first part of the soft release process is when we get the animal uh, straight from the Johannes Ruala Veterinary Hospital, knowing his particular health conditions to maybe point out something that, ooh, check this, this his breathing or uh, the way he walks or he was injured and he was limping before, so be very careful with this. So we take them out and we keep them with us. We keep mm -hmm. them in a safe location in the reserve uh, to, so they sleep in an area that we can control them. And whenever they wake up, we take them out to the field. It can go from two to five hours sometimes to follow them. It depends on the animal behavior. Um, we've, we've found out as well that some of the older animals, when they're not very young, they, they, they're, like, their priority is sometimes more to find a safe place. So they will try to find a burrow before start feeding. But of course we need to make sure they start feeding. They don't lose condition and weight and they start mm -hmm. picking up. And also that there's enough availability of, of food in the area that we thought it was the correct one. Because, of course, we choose an area from the reserve that we think it's, it's good for them. But they may not think the same as us. I mean, at the end, they know better. They've been, they've been pangolining for, for millions, <laughs> millions of, years. of years. Exactly. So they know way better than us. And sometimes what we think it's a good area or a good terrain for them, or there's a lot of burrows or whatever, for some reason they're not comfortable in that area and they will take you to thickets and drainage line on their favorite areas, which are the tricky ones. And so then you're saying they're picky. They're a bit picky. 
<laughs> yeah, well, I would. I, I think it's specialized more, mm -hmm. but from our perspective, maybe picky because we're seeing ants everywhere and they're not eating. Mm -hmm. but maybe that species, or in that moment, or those ants, that ant hill doesn't have net, eggs at that time yes. of the day, or the ants are too deep because it's a little bit chilly. I mean, there's so many things we don't know exactly how they work yet mm -hmm. that we can interpret as being picky or special or something, but maybe they're just specialized in what they do. Yes. And then after a few days, the soft release process, a lot of people ask how long it takes. It can take from four days to four months or even mm -hmm. more. So it depends on the animal size, weight, condition, behavior, and every single thing. It's very particular for each animal. So once the animal, we, we make sure that the animal is comfortable and it's feeding and his condition is good and it's feeling comfortable, we, leave, we let, let them go. And we let, when we let an animal go, we use two types of tracking devices. One, which is a satellite tag which by the way is quite expensive and it's mm -hmm. one of the things that we struggle the most to get found. And the other one is a, it's a VHF, VHF, a telemetry mm -hmm. tag, the one with the antenna that, or a area mm -hmm. that many of you have seen in documentaries so we can find them physically in that moment. And the satellite yes. tags give us the opportunity to uh, check online on our phones or our computers where the animal is. It's not as magical as it sounds, there, I'm using telemetry there, it's not as magical as it sounds that you can open and see where your pangolin is right now. If it's underground, it won't ping. If it, there's bad weather, since it's um, satellite technology, it won't ping. Uh, it's expensive to have this, the, the devices pinging very often. So mm -hmm. in some of our animals, we have it every one hour or every three hours, or depending how much we can afford, that is reality. So yeah. sometimes you know where your animal was three hours ago, but when you go look, it, look for it into the field, even though they look small animals and in our heads, it couldn't move that fast. A lot of people ask me how fast they move. And my answer is always faster than you think. <laughs> I don't know exactly how fast can they go. Of course, they don't go as a, as a dog running or anything. But to be an animal that moves, particularly the species that I work with, it moves bipedally in two, yes. two legs only as a T-Rex. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't expect it would move quickly, but you distract for 10 seconds talking to someone, you turn around and your penguin's gone. They're <laughs> quite fast and they're so four by four. Well, I used to say four by four. And so what someone told me it should be two by two. They are, yeah, they go through everything. You can you can put the video, that would be very interesting. Let me show you this. It will mute us, but if you unmute yeah. yourself, you can still talk cool. over it, but I'll put it on the screen. It's very cool to see a penguin walk. Yeah, well, that's Ramfi in part of his soft release process. That's his first tag slap, uh, the VHF uh, tracking device that we put on him days before his release. And you can see how beautiful they walk. I mean, it's it's actually, I keep saying that it takes time in your head to understand why that animal walks like that. The tail is held high, and, and that's actually uh, a good indicator for us. If we see an animal that is dragging its tail, and I repeat, we're talking about Temming Spangolin, because mm -hmm. other species have different features and behavior and they move differently. But with Temmings particularly, it's important to see the tail, the tail held high. And that will tell us that the animal's it's strong and it's in a good condition. We have another clip of a pangolin on the move. This is at Pinda. And they go through every terrain. Oh, that's beautiful. Look how incredible. <laughs> I'm still amazed. <laughs> it's really beautiful. And I want to touch on something you said before, Leno, is that, you know, uh, your program needs so much help. I mean, Adams needs help with undercover equipment. And, you know, for you, it's um, could be, I'm just hearing a bit of a feedback. Sorry, hold on. Um, oh, let me just fix something here there we go echo oh. <laughs> Hold on. oh sorry about that no don't worry Everybody? um and and while tomorrow fun you know we've we've supported the pangolin project as much as we can but we can do more if we get more people to help us so what we've done so far and and thanks to friends at biologists without borders we've donated three different telemetry sets to help with the monitoring i personally got one of those in my hands when it arrived from Yay. wild tomorrow found thank you to everyone who donated and was involved in that particular donation 
Uh, at that moment, I was monitoring our pangolins with a telemetry from Magnoni Private Game Reserve that they used to monitor their wildlife. So we were sharing this telemetry because they needed to monitor their cheetah, their rhino, and then I was looking for a gap to get a telemetry, <laughs> and it was and it was a little bit tricky. And then we got donated a telemetry equipment from you guys, from Wild Tomorrow Found, uh, which was incredibly helpful to have it available 24-7 only for pangolins. Because awesome. uh, pangolins sometimes, um, well, not sometimes, quite often, they, they take us to emergency moves. And when, when one of our pangolins is close to, our, to one of the boundaries of the reserve, to the fences, sometimes they're nocturnal mainly. So I usually stay awake till 2 or 3 in the morning checking the satellite pings to make sure our animals are moving in their territories and quite safely. But sometimes there's an animal moving straight in a straight line for the last two hours heading to a, to one of our boundaries, to the uh, electric fence, that actually behind the electric fence maybe is the, the highway. So oh. we need to head out at two in the morning. I need to call an armed guy, some, some of the APU people or some of the uh, trails guides from Magnoni uh, or Pinda to go out at that time of night to try to find our pangolin. So we need clearly a telemetry available 24 seven uh, and to go fetch him because because the immediate dangers that they're outside of the reserve are on unbelievable. Like as, as Adam mentioned, I mean, unfortunately pangolins are currently the most trafficked mammal in the planet after humans. And, and yeah, slowly uh, together with the awareness and the, the exposure that pangolins are getting out there because of COVID and because of other things that maybe not in, in the right context, but pangolins have been coming popular. Um, also, it's unfortunately becoming popular that their scales are uh, very worthy and they cost a yeah. lot of money. And so it's it's terrible to see that in the same amount of, not maybe not the same amount, but at the same time that people are learning about them and knowing how the crisis is, also the dark side of it, it's learning about it. So they're targeting them even in areas that they weren't targeted before as Guazulu Natal, where they were mm -hmm. locally extinct. Now it's a thing. Now there's pangolins in Guazulu Natal, you know? So we need a lot of resources to be able yes. to keep them safe, to do the follow-ups to their veterinary expenses. Um, and every single part of, of the process from a pangolin being detected in the trade before being rescued till today that the pangolin is maybe sleeping in a burrow mm -hmm. now, now, it's so much work and, and resources needed involved. So it's, it's, yeah, it's very important that people realize that this donations is not only because, well, believe me, it's not that we're going to get better salaries or we're going to get <laughs> cool stuff. It goes straight, straight, to the the straight to the program. And yeah. we have an amazing supporter, Barbara Moroli, who's joined us today. And uh, Hi, thank you. Yeah, and she actually sponsored the um, tag replacement at Pinda recently so okay. you know it's a real um amazing gift for someone to be able to help so specifically um so thank you Barbara <laughs> I would and love I would love to Barbara realize how much it helps mm -hmm. she I promise you she hasn't realized how much she's helping um hopefully one day she can go out there in the bush with us in South Africa and see exactly what she did for us, what she did for a particular pangolin mm -hmm. and how important that is. Because sometimes for some reason a tag can fall down or being chowed by a predator and then we need a replacement like now. Yeah. And, and the price of those tags are not something you can just buy oh, now, you know what I mean? So, yeah. I mean? so thank you, Barbara. I don't know how many tags that were replaced in that particular replacement. I think there were multiple, but that was $3,500. So, exactly. You know, it, and and they, they don't last forever either right at six is it about six months what's the lifespan it depends, of the tag it depends directly on the amount of times you you put the, the settings to be to to ping what we call it mm. to ping so this sad tag gave us an average of a thousand pings if i put the settings that i wanted to ping every minute it will last a thousand minutes but if wow. that's why we need to you need to optimize the usage of the tags and we try to to learn every animal's behavior and some of them are a little bit earlier pangolins than others or or they stay awake till too late so we put the pings from i don't know midnight till six in the morning and all the rest of the day we don't have any pings if the animal's active we're not going to know but we cannot afford to have that um tag pinging all the time thank you barbara she's she's coming hopefully Amazing. Uh, again in august if she can make it you know travel in this era is so hard to predict but hopefully she will be there in august and she'd love to meet you lena so i hopefully be back to <laughs> yeah, there with the well, barbara i'm waiting for 
for the embassy to start processing visas, because at the moment I'm stuck in Mexico and the embassy is not renewing my visa yet, mine or any others. So hopefully from for August, you and I are going to be there in the field. It's a date. You're going to experience, <laughs> exactly. You're going to experience exactly how incredible it is, your help and your support. And um, then I have a question. Do you use um, camera traps for monitoring as well? Yes, we use camera traps. That's another thing. Uh, we had a particular female pangolin which was rescued pregnant from the trade. So when she arrived to the reserve, she was still pregnant. We had no clue how far in the pregnancy she was, but we wanted to do quite a follow-up on her. She's one of the shyest pangolins I've ever worked with. She was very sensitive to our presence. We weren't doing good being close to her. Her name is Shidulu. And for Shidulu, the ideal thing, it was a camera trap. Uh, but at that point, we didn't have any camera traps designated for pangolins. And, and we are not only, I mean, I am working with pangolins, but, but every reserve is monitoring also their cheetah, their wild dogs, their hyena den, their rhino, a particular area for, right. for snares or poaching. So at that point, um, Dane, who is a wildlife manager at, Pin, at Magnoni Private Game Reserve, he allowed me to use one of his leopard cameras uh, for a few <laughs> days to put it there and then he needed it back to be replaced and all these things and then um yeah it's those kind of things uh, it's ridiculous to see and it's very frustrating for us because we realize if we had enough resources how much our work would be facilitated or became easier and also how much more we can learn about pangolins because let's not forget it's a species very unknown there right. is many 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 things we don't know about pangolins and and we're learning every single day and and the much data the much monitoring the more the more we can do uh, it's going to be groundbreaking for the future mm -hmm. generations and programs to monitor pangolins we're we're learning it like, at least this program of reintroducing them back into the wild in an area locally extinct has never been done before so uh, it's everything is new it's exactly. is what can happen and i'm putting that url up there if anyone wants to donate for <laughs> very Thank practical you. supplies um to help pangolins that's where you can go and and i have some good news for you lano i had a, a whatsapp from a very good friend at um a ngo called f stop foundation and their mission is is the power of uh photography to help conservation so they do a lot of camera traps so he's told me he would love to get you some more um, camera traps to the field, which is exciting. We also need to I got send them to and you I'm in kidding. Mexico and bring them over. Oh, me too. So, thank you so um, much. Expect a bunch of camera traps coming your way. And I wish William could come on and say, you know, tell you more about it. We'll get you guys connected. But um, sure. Yeah, there's more camera traps coming at least. Yay! And <laughs> <laughs> you, you see, with this first camera trap that I, it was one. And I'm not an expert on camera traps at all. So I went, we needed to put it where Shedulis Borough was. We watched the thickest area furthest from any road in the reserve. It was like a 15 minute walk, thick in summer, 40 degrees terrible. And Simone and Ruan and, and Jono and the people who've done that work with me, if they're watching it, they're going to know what I'm talking about. And then we got there, we set up the camera trap. We were very excited. And then we waited a week because in that part, there's no signal. So you cannot put the feature that it sends to your phone. Mm -hmm. And next week we do this hectic walk again. We got there and we got nothing but a porcupine in the camera. <laughs> it was oh so frustrating. It's just so frustrating. But of course it was one and there was a many borrows and we weren't sure. So thank you so much. You have no clue, honestly, how much it, it helps the pangolins directly. It helps me, it helps the team, it helps the, the research and everything, but directly the pangolins at the end is, is, is the main objective, you know, to yeah. keep them safe, to, to do better for them to try to understand them better and that will help us keep incredibly. them safe so too. Now, I think one of the highlights I'm sure for you, Leno, was, and we ha I don't know if this is filmed on a camera trap, but uh, it's from the African Pangolin Working Group. It's the first images of the first wild born pango pup. I love that word that it's called yeah. a pango <laughs> pup. A baby pangolin is called a pango pup. It's the first images of, um, the, it's images of video of the first Pango pup born from a rescued, rehabilitated, rewilded pangolin. Yep. So, was it? Do you know? Was it the camera trap that, or how did they? It's in Penda. It? It's mm. in Penda. It's a camera trap. Exactly. It was a camera trap, and that female was the same situation as Shidulu. She was rescued pregnant. Uh, I mean, she was poached pregnant. Rescued pregnant. She went through all the recovery process. She picked up a condition. She was moved to KwaZulu Natal. She was soft released. In that particular process of that female, I wasn't involved because I was in another location. I was located in another reserve. But of course, I, I, 
I followed every step they did. And, and luckily they were able to pick the baby in video. And that's what we think. We have no clue if Shidulu gave birth. We think she did already. She must have already. We don't know if the pup is still, the panga pup is still alive, if she's still in a burrow. We, we don't know. We haven't been able to get images. But luckily, Pinda got the first ever panga pup being born in Guazulu Natal after local extinction. And that's, yeah, that day we were all imagined. Can we I, I'll show you some, I'll put some of that video on the screen. Yeah, Let please me, do. Um, just, oops, that's not all right. Let me see how we do this. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I think they can hear you. Is that, does the pup, does the mum kind of protect the pup underneath her? Yeah, well, at the, we don't know exactly. There's, it's, believe me, there's not enough images. If people wants to Google like panga pup in the wild, like you're not gonna find much about them. We don't know exactly how it works. We know they, they, they give birth um, and inside a burrow, but then we don't know exactly how long the pup will stay inside the burrow uh, before coming out with the mom. So at the beginning, it will be it will be the mom going out and then coming back to breastfeed the pup. But no one knows, knows exactly when the pup will start coming out. So this pup, we don't know exactly when it was born. <laughs> we don't know exactly how old it is. We just know she's there already, but we don't know how it works. I mean, you can, with, with the, some of the data that I'm telling you, maybe with the satellite tag, you will know that this female was in, staying in that burrow for the last two weeks. But that doesn't tell you it was born two weeks ago. Maybe it's, I don't know, a week only, or maybe a month, or I don't know. We still don't know. We're finding out. It seems like the pup stays in the burrow um, sometime uh, before uh, it starts coming out to explore just around the burrow. That actually Pinda got images as well of the pup on, on its own, walking around the burrow, but very close, and then, and then going back in. And then after that, it came out with the mom and it seems like they only bring them out when they're going to switch burrows. So the baby will, will ride on top of the mom and mm. she will change to another burrow, but the pup will still quite protect it. And then, well, she will start foraging with the mom. We don't know exactly for how long. It seems like the panga pup will stay around two years with the mom before being independent. But all of these things haven't been like, we don't have enough data to, to prove it. You know, it's known that maybe it's considered their dads, but but it's we don't know exactly. Everyone was loving that video. I mean, it's beautiful to it see. Is. I don't it think is just you know, and that's a camera trap. So again, it was really helpful in the field to be able to make those observations. And there's and another. Um, sorry to interrupt. There's another incredible case of Tata. Tata was a female that was rescued, pregnant as well. She was poached, pregnant, rescued. She was in the Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital, very weak. So she needed to stay a little bit longer than usual in the hospital. And then she gave birth in the hospital. Wow. Everyone was like excited, but also very worried, you know, that the baby was born in captivity. And Tata's baby, uh, Tata. Tata's panga pop, is called Tot. And oh, Tot. Tater and Tot. <laughs> yeah. So Tot um, has been raised since day one by the African Pangali Working Group, particularly by Nikki. Uh, Nikki Wright, which is the, the founder of the Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital, and she's also the director, general director of the African Pangolin Working Group. And I think it's maybe the first ever pangolin mm -hmm. and this species that has been raised since day one. So they've been, of course, measuring and recording as much information as they can. If you go yeah. to their social media, you're going to see updates on that baby, which is literally from day one. Even for us, it's been like mind blowing to see how the scales look like literally on day one and then how they start kind of developing more strength and all these things that are just unbelievable Incredible. and it's the first ever. Then we have a video actually from Rigat Hoffman who is in the conservation team at Pender and this was just a yeah, few yeah. days ago and this is yeah, so let's show it for everybody here it's so, I'm so cute. jealous. <laughs> I've worked in Yeah, I've worked a few times with Richard in the field and I'm feeling incredibly happy that he was able to see that. A little bit jealous as well, I'm not going to lie. I wish I, <laughs> I, I wish. Was... Sorry. No, go, go. I was going to put it on again so people could yeah, see go. it. Okay. There he's riding on mom's back. It's really cute, isn't it? It's going to be just... <laughs> 
Yeah, I've dreamed, I've dreamed of that day when I see a, a pango pop up on top of its mom. It's just um, amazing. It's adorable. So, Lena, uh, people saying their heart's exploding. I mean, it's adorable. Um, we have some questions about um, pangolins and, you know, your experience as this amazing human that gets to spend <laughs> so much time with them and get to know them. Um, let me go back here. There was a question um, from Pam Erickson asking, who has a zebra named after her, actually, at our reserve, Erickson? <laughs> Hi, Pam. <laughs> do pangolins imprint on humans? Have they imprinted on you, do you think, Leno? Do they know who you are? Um, okay, I, I was going to tell you that I didn't understand the question. Imprinted, like they bonded or something with me? Is that what Yeah, you mean? or, you know, with rescued birds, they sort of see you as mom, right? And okay, they you know, would get too close to you, you know, in a way, but do they then... I've heard a few different opinions from people that has been involved this close with pangolins. I'm going to tell you my own experience, uh, particularly with Ramphi and Corey, that are the animals that have spent months with me every day. Yes, they know exactly who I am. Yes, they are more comfortable with me than with other people. They know that my smell. They know my voice. They are comfortable with me. But also, I, it's, it's, it's hard to describe, but considering pangolins are mammals, we may expect that they behave as any other mammal that you rescue. You can rescue a baby raccoon or a baby rabbit or whatever, and that animal will be safe with you and will cuddle with you and will look into your eyes and will have this type of behaviors. Uh, pangolins don't. I keep saying that they are more reptile than mammals. They are not. <laughs> but their behavior, I compare it more if I introduce to you my iguana or my monitor lizard. You know, they won't look into your eyes or connect with you. Or if you call their names, they're not going to turn around and come to you. Nothing like that. So, yes, they, they, uh, they know me. And maybe they, they've assumed that I'm not a threat. Mm -hmm. but, but thinking that they love me, care about me, miss me, or anything like that, mm, I don't think so. <laughs> which, um, which makes it beautiful. I mean, it makes yeah. it so beneficial for them. You know, at the end, you put a pangolin in the ground. And he's on his own little world. He knows exactly what he needs to do. He's not going to turn around. If, if you distract him, he's gone. He's gone. He's never going to, oh, where's mommy? No, man, not at all. He's off chasing I that's beautiful. I found that amazing. So I mean, that's crazy. their best chance to, to be wild, to not, you know, see exactly. you. Exactly. So, yeah, they learn people that they spend time with or, or the monitors that go often to monitor. They can prefer someone better than another person for some reason they can be more comfortable with one to another but clearly they will pick the scent of someone they've never seen before when we had new people joining me for the walks because of course i need to walk with an armed guide and sometimes with more people if i'm working at night or things like that uh, the pangolin can pick that there's someone that he doesn't recognize and be a little bit more stressed mm -hmm. so that's another thing that i always like to point out that it's it's hard to understand a pangolin by seeing it because they're not very expressive or expressive at all but, but once you've spent time with them, I see some videos of guides finding a pangolin in the wild and showing it to the guests and things like that. And I can see that animal being stressed. Now, like, two mm. years ago, I would think, oh, look, that animal just stopped. No, it's not stopped. They freeze. They panic. <laughs> they go flat in the ground. These things are very sensitive wow. to our presence. So uh, I always like to point out that because... With my photos, people may think that, oh, if I found randomly one day a pangolin in the wild, I'm going to hold it in my shoulder as Lena did. Like, dude, no, don't even go close to it. Believe me, you can stress them so much. And their immune system can get also, like, uh, jeopardized. Like, yeah, they're very, very sensitive to stress and to humans' mm -hmm. presence. Uh, so we need to be very respectful. And we had a question from Matt, actually, who's our amazing intern in New York. Hi, Matt. Um, Hi, Matt. <laughs> he's asking, is there learned behaviors? Do you have to teach them? to do anything or do they kind of figure it out on their own? You have, I've seen you bringing them sort of to trees to feed and is that what you have to teach I them? Think, I think I would say not teach them, but show them sometimes. Mm -hmm. Of course those animals don't belong to that particular environment because they were poached somewhere else and brought to KwaZulu Natal. So maybe showing them a, a species of ants that they haven't found on their own for some reason by smell like cocktail ants. We say like, oh, we've seen cocktail ants in that area. Let's go show this pangolin and let's see if he prefers that species of ants. It happened that you take a pangolin to an area that there is now to harvest a termite ants that I would assume for now that they were their favorites because it looked like. And then some of them, they just get there and they're like, 
hmm, not my kind of food, thank you. <laughs> you know? So we show them things. I remember with, with Ramphi, try to encourage him to do mud bath, mud bathing in the mud. And at the beginning, he was like, I don't like that. And one day he did it. But I don't think I taught him. You know what I mean? I exposed him to somewhere that he could um, use his natural behavior or his instinct. I have actually a um, video you sent me of, uh, let me see if I have it. Oh, yes, of the pangolin in the mud. Let's show this one. Ramflas, ¿qué haces? Porque te estás revolcando en caca. Ramflas, no. No. He's squeezing it inside. What that was he was, doing? <laughs> that was actually zebra dung. Uh, they roll in dung as well, as happy as they do in mud. So mm. I've seen them doing it with zebra dung, warthog, buffalo, and rhino. So I have a few videos. Buffalo, I would say, is the more squishy favorite one because it's quite muddy. But then, of course, if it's part of the soft release process, then you need to bring the animal back to the vehicle after <laughs> rolling in buffalo dung, you know? But they do it so it, it it looks like they're having fun. I'm not saying that they're having yeah. fun as part of their behavior, but it looks so enjoyable that you're like, like okay, it's fine, just go for it. <laughs> and then there's this picture, which was a mystery to me. Is that pangolin poop? Yes, that's. I keep saying how amazing is like you cannot find pangolin poop in Google if you look for it. So <laughs> feel yourself very privileged to be looking at pangolin poop. Uh, we were taking samples, of course, for some research and. And the the pop the poo sorry it's it's way bigger than you would expect from an animal that size that it may be the size of a cat or something and it's way bigger um, and also it's it's pretty much uh, soil with termites and ants heads you could see them in that photo it looks the the small little parts of of ants and termites and in this case a little bit of grass because it was a harvester termites that they have these little pieces of grass in their termite mounds. So he ingests them and clearly he didn't um, digest them. Right. So they come out exactly as they were. So yeah, it's very interesting. I keep showing the poo. I think I found, and, and kids particularly love poo. Of well, not, love to talk about poo. So it's important to see how pangolin poo looks like. Yeah, and before I bring Adams back in, because I know there's some questions for him, I just want to bring, this is my favorite part. I've been lucky to meet one pangolin. And what blew me away was its little feet. I'm going to put this picture of Leno's on the screen. <laughs> it's so yeah. adorable. That's Ramphi back food. Ramphi when he was quite young. And that's we keep saying that it looks between a tortoise and an elephant foot and quite human also mm -hmm. and like a potato. I don't know. It's like an interesting mixture. <laughs> it's adorable. And let me bring Adams. I know he's there in the Congo. It's nighttime. But we had a question for him. But when he comes back on, I'll... I'll direct it his way, but um, here's another one for you, Leno. Do they mate? Do you know if they mate for life, or are they pretty solitary and they sort of mate and well, split? We don't know, but I will tell you from my experience. Um, I don't think they'll mate for life as a, with a particular partner. Uh, but we don't know. There's not. There's no research about it. Maybe Adam knows a little bit more. Uh, we don't know how they mate. Just to start with. So mm -hmm. we don't really know. We've seen scent marking either females and males, but we don't know exactly who chases who or how they exactly find each other. We think it's by smell, by their scent marking. Uh, we don't know if there's a particular season for mating, but it seems like it, it is because last season, unfortunately, in, in some of the rescues on the, um, on, from the poaching, on the sting operations, there were quite a few pregnant females what made us think that maybe there is a particular breathing season for pangolins, but all of that is still unknown. It's crazy, isn't it, that this animal on the edge of extinction and so vulnerable, there's still so little known about it and they don't do well in captivity, so they're, yeah. yeah. I mean, you probably know more about pangolins than most people in the world, which is an amazing thing, Leno. <laughs> maybe, maybe, <laughs> at least in my experience. And yeah, it's important what you mentioned. Um, captivity always is a, for a lot of people, it's an option on conservation. You know, breathe them in captivity, keep them in captivity and whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, in this particular case with Taming Spangolin, first of all, uh, uh, Taming Spangolin have never fed in captivity. There's no way to feed them in captivity. So when they are kept in the hospital or some things like that, they take them out to walk. And if they're weak, too weak or too sick, they just tube feed them. 
But there's no way to have a pangolin captivity. There's no way, at least from this species, there no one found a way. And pangolins in zoos, it seems like it's six zoos around the world, and it's all of them white-bellied pangolin, one of the eight species. So it's not a possibility, I think, to invest too much energy and find out how can we keep them in captivity. It's, it's to put all the energy in how can we keep them alive out there. We don't need to have them in captivity now. I mean, there's just a few left. So we should focus on keep them safe out there, I guess. Yes. Um, thanks, Lena. Uh, Adams, do you, this is a question. Do you happen to know Rod Cassidy at Sangha Pangolin Project? Um, I happen to met his son very randomly. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, we couldn't quite hear Adams, but um, what I'll Let's do see, is follow up with him. But um, we had another, maybe we have time for a last question. Um, do you know, Leno, why they became extinct in, in KwaZulu-Natal? And, and they've, they're assumed to be extinct for 30 years. That's what we hear locally extinct, um, kind of what are the, other than poaching, what are the threats to them? It's the habitat loss, clearly mm. the habitat loss. Um, and, and yeah, we think the poaching, I mean, no one can prove that they were 100% extinct, but no one can prove they saw a pangolin in the last 30 years either. You know, mm. there's not evidence of any sightings. And there's a few rumors of a sighting 12 years ago somewhere, but no one has a photo, no one has a proof. So we don't yeah. know. Adams, can you can you hear us? Well, it was good at least to see him, but I feel like we're we're out of time. I mean, we could talk about pangolins all day, especially because it's World Pangolin Day. Um, so I want to thank everyone for coming, and especially Leno and Adam Skasinga for joining us and sharing your information about the work you're doing. And like, truly, you are. Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> with a little bit of delay but you can awesome but you guys are really heroes to us you know protecting pangolins on the front lines and and looking after them you know monitoring them making sure their reintroduction goes well so i just want to kind of implore everyone if you've been moved by the work that leno and adams are doing please especially it's world pangolin day if you can go online and donate we'll make sure they get really practical equipment um to help them continue doing what they do keeping pangolins safe so yeah, we've got this. You're, you guys really are heroes, pangolin protectors. Thank you so much. Um, I think, oh, there was one more question about rhino horn, you know, that it's, um, it has, and actually it's keratin too, just like pangolin scales. Like is, is there education being done on that for buyers, do you know, in, in Asian markets that it has no medicinal value? It is. It is starting as, as, well, but, but we, we must remember, and I always compare it to my culture, because it's the one I know in Mexico, uh, there's things that can be proven that are a lie and that, that don't help for anything. But fighting with cultural beliefs that are older than 2000 years, is not that easy. So even, even their information is out there, there's still a lot of, of um, yeah, well, of people who believes in the magical properties of things and, and not only animal resources, but even other types of things that we all do, you know, lighting a candle for some reason or, or doing a ceremony for some reason. So there's, unfortunately, I think we're, we're fighting a cultural belief, which is very, very strong, which is traditional Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, there's, there's education going on. And Adams actually said that they're doing it uh, quite strong with the youth in, in, uh, and Republic of Congo, but but I think we 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 still far <laughs> we still far. We need to keep fighting. Yeah, and on that note, I know that China last year, I believe, uh, <laughs> officially took pangolin off the um, official TCM traditional Chinese medicine list, which is great. So that's a move in the right direction. They also upgraded their laws so pangolins are protected at the highest level. Um, same as pandas, but there's still a lot of work to do. Is that their their scales are still used in um, in commercial um, pharmacy, like uh, there's patents and everything with pangolin products. Yeah. So yeah, and unfortunately, unfortunately, many times ju just just because they made it illegal, it doesn't mean it's gonna stop. I mean, it's also illegal to trade kidneys, and mm -hmm. it has never stopped. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's a good step that there, there's new laws being called out, yes, 
but from there that they are applied properly, that there's no corruption in between and everything. There's years and years of, of road there that we need to go through. So yeah, it's small steps. I'm, I'm happy with it, but it's not something to say like, yay, China's going to ban it. No, it's not. It doesn't happen like that. Well, thank you so much, Leno and Adams. Thank you for joining us. I know it's late for you. Um, thank you. Just in awe of the work you do, um, happy Pangolin Day, World Pangolin Day. Um, and thanks to everybody who joined us. Um, and we'll say goodbye. I'll play a video. Um, and thank you. Happy World Pangolin Day. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Adams. Thank, thank you, you, Wendy. Stay safe, Adam. Stay safe. Take care.